Hi everyone, thanks for coming for today's event. We will be starting in 10 minutes, so please grab a drink and a food and take a seat. Thank you.
Hi, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you very much for joining us at tonight's event with SG Innovate and the UK Department for International Trade. My name is Tuan, and I'm with SG Innovate. Um, could I just have a show of hands? Who among our audience tonight is here at SG Innovate for the very, very first time? All right, so we've got about 30, 40%, and the rest have actually been uh, very familiar with what it is that SG Innovate does. And this uh, session tonight is one of the many different activities that SG Innovate does throughout the year uh, with our various corporate and international partners uh, from the UK, from France, from Canada, and so forth, in order to reinforce the importance and the impact of AI in our society and the future economy. Uh, SG Innovate has had a lot of uh, good friends, and today we are very honored to actually have our friends uh, from the United Kingdom, uh, specifically the Department for International Trade, who has worked tirelessly with a group of uh, important uh, business partners and startups from the UK visiting Singapore yesterday and today. Uh, we want to bring together not just startups, but also investors, corporate partners who work with researchers and government uh, representatives across industries to help connect and catalyze conversations and collaborations. And one that is very, very important uh, in our uh, future and today's economy is the impact of AR on the future of work. And without further ado, I, on behalf of the UK Department for International Trade uh, and uh, Commissioner Black as well, would like to start off the evening. And uh, without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Mark Jensens, who is our moderator for today's Thank panel you. discussion, to the stage. Mark, please. Thank you very much. Um, welcome this evening. I'm going to go through the introductions very rapidly and actually welcome all my guests up on stage for this evening. In fact, I'm the one who does no talking. So please, please come up on stage. I'll quickly introduce as people come up. Uh, so first, Dr. Sun Jukuk, uh, is Chief Futurist, Chief Researcher Officer at Skills Future. Zihao, maybe you can join us as well. Uh, Zihao Zhu is Investment Manager at Octopus. Uh, Natalie, if I can get you up on stage. Natalie Black, Her Majesty's Trade Commission for Asia Pacific, very important guest. Uh, Dr. Sino Ario, if you can also join, uh, CEO and founder of Tiger. Information, by the way, is in your bro brochures or online, etc. so we're not going to go through deep bios. And Ian, if you can come up on stage as well, Ian Jones, Chief Strategy Officer, co-founder of Amplify. So welcome everyone on the stage. <laughs> so tonight's discussion is on the future of AI, the impact on the workforce, and I think importantly, obviously, given uh, the, the number of people who have traveled from overseas to be here is also reflecting on the importance of the relationship between Singapore, UK, and the importance of also what that means in terms of development of AI and new technology as well. So maybe Natalie, I'll get you to open up just quickly in terms of some of your thoughts around that for tonight. Do I just want to take up the mic? Yeah. The mic? I think, here, grab this one. I'll, yeah. I'll shuffle. First of all, I'm going to complain because Ian at the end here has looked after himself and he's got a beer and the rest of us <laughs> don't. Um, uh, so firstly, uh, just a big thank you um, to SG Innovate and panelists. Um, it's wonderful to see the room so packed. Uh, let's not ask about health and safety, uh, but it looks wonderful. Um, so I'm really, really pleased that there's so much interest here. Um, the reason uh, why we were particularly keen uh, to talk about AI in a UK-Singapore uh, context is because I, I think we think about this issue in a, in a very similar way. Um, there's a lot of technical experts in the room who will talk to us about uh, the, the importance of access to data and volume, particularly when you're thinking about machine learning and really trying to train all of the skills that we know will make a huge difference to our society, and I'm sure we'll talk about that a lot more. Um, but for me personally, um, when we think about AI, it's not only about the opportunities, um, but it's also about the challenges. And I think those countries who proactively engage with the issues of bias in artificial intelligence, uh, regulation, um, ethics, will actually ultimately end up leading the charge. 
and I'm really pleased that UK, the UK and Singapore have collaborated so closely on these issues, and I hope that we continue to do so. Uh, so in the UK, we have the Centre um, for Data Ethics, for example, and in Singapore, we have the AF, AI Ethics Council, and there's a huge flow of both businesses, um, academics, um, and government officials who are coming backwards and forwards and talking about these issues. So I, I think there's probably not a more important issue in um, the tech sector at the moment, but as I say, I think um, those countries who will really lead the charge are the ones who are up for talking about mo both the opportunities and the challenges. Maybe, Ian, you're, you're certainly leading the charge uh, in the UK with Amplify, and we'll give you a mic. Um, maybe just share some of the challenges you're seeing uh, and, and some of the, the innovations happening. And also, obviously, our focus today is around skills, workforce as well, so perhaps spread some of that in. And what I'm asking also the panelists here to sort of actively contribute through the discussion, and so I don't talk. <laughs> yeah, sure. So in terms of challenges that we faced in uh, at Amplify, um, A is we're a startup, so obviously lack of money, <laughs> uh, which affects every startup. But in terms of deploying our technology, I guess there's two factors uh, that kind of most AI startups and companies face. There's a technical challenge, and then there's a human challenge. So the technical challenge, primarily for certainly what we're involved in, which is machine learning, is lack of data. The bigger the data set, the bigger the training set, the more the, the machine can learn, the better the machine can learn, the higher quality the results it will give you. Uh, our technology actually leverage, leverages open source content from the internet. So we've, we've circumvented that challenge by basically going to the internet, which is the largest data set you could ever hope to access in the first instance. So we've solved that challenge. The second challenge is the human challenge, the user challenge. And, and this is kind of twofold. First is, it's about getting the user's trust. So there's a lot of AI applications out there that even the developer can't tell you how it's got from those inputs to those outputs. Now, if I'm a user and I'm relying on the machine's outputs to make a decision or a machine-driven driven forecast, and I can't audit or get at least line of sight to how it's come to that point or that decision or that recommendation, those outputs, then I'm not going to trust the machine. So overcoming trust or, b or building trust in the machine is critical. The other element as well is convincing the user that this is not, put, this is not about putting you out of a job. So at Amplify, we're about enhancing business intelligence and research. It's about allowing the machine to do the, what it's really good at. And AI today is about collecting big data. It's about processing big data. It's analyzing big data. It's looking for patterns across unstructured data, things that humans can't do very well. The machine does that extremely well. What the human is really good at is applying intuition to those results, deriving insights, making recommendations, making decisions. So we're all about, not about putting people out of work, but actually empowering them, uh, getting them to a point where they're able to make better informed decisions. So for us, it's about making you more productive and getting you to a point where you're making smarter, faster decisions. Maybe soon, June, just in terms of reflecting on that, in terms of the skill side of things, in terms of the need to make that happen, but also uh, the challenges around that and what, what, what Singapore is doing in particular. Mm. Um, yes, in, in, in Singapore, we, has, well, we have, if people know about us, we have been preparing our workforce for the past 50 years. Uh, it's always about pre-skilling them. Uh, it's always about re new skilling them, and so forth in the area of AI and the beyond AI and all the various technology uh, requirement in demand skill set like uh, uh, data analytics. Uh, we are working very closely with IMDA. We are working very closely with um, even employers group to look into uh, pre preempting what kind of skills need. But this is very actually very challenging because the employer skills is always running ahead of what the supply set can do. So that's why we try to bring in together with the, the university and the polytechnic to get and say that can we work closely with the employers to understand what skills would you need um, ahead of time so that the, the university, the, the colleges can prepare adequate uh, curriculum to help people. Yeah. And, and Zihao, in terms of from your seat uh, coming from the UK, as you, as you look sort of out in and from an investment standpoint, where are you seeing the big investment dollars going towards right now and where the opportunities lie <coughs> for, for AI and new technologies? 
I guess there, there are sort of two ways that, uh, that we can sort of see AI being applied. There's one in which, you know, you have people in Oxford, Cambridge, Imperial, ETH, and Zurich, you know, really driving the forefront of the underlying artificial intelligence sort of technology and breaking new ground in, in the deep tech side of things. Um, but actually one thing that we've seen over the last few years is lots of companies that are using, um, using those technologies off the shelf to apply them to everyday work. And um, you know, the, the way that can apply to skills and, and the sort of, I guess, the future of human work uh, is quite interesting, right, on, on both sides. So on, on the deep tech side, um, everyone's always talking about the singularity and, and when the, you know, the artificial, artificial intelligence is able to compute better than the human brain. I mean, personally, I think that we're a long ways off from that. Um, but the bit that people underestimate is the incremental changes and the incremental um, sort of development of using relatively sort of standard or solved problems today in everyday use cases. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, just teachers looking to grade papers, right? Or, I don't know, a bank looking to make credit decisions and make lending decisions. All of these things have been affected highly by artificial intelligence over the last few years in ways that people probably don't realize. And that means the number of sort of bank clerks that we have and the number of uh, teaching assistants that we need uh, are being reduced every day, you know, and they will continue to reduce. Um, but at the same time, you know, clearly with any kind of technological development, you have the requirement of new skill and new labor, and, and we're seeing that all the time as well. Can I, just, I just want to add on to, to your analysis is that from, from where, we, where we stand in, in Skill Future, we are seeing that essentially the workforce may not be everybody need to be skilled up to the same level of AI experts. If you look at three baskets, I would say that one basket will be the user. So take for example, today I'm working with uh, uh, EN's company, Amplify, and we are just practically a user using a, a data volumes platform. We, we don't even need to know the, the algorithm, but we may from time to time check in and say that, okay, if I want to do this deep dive, how do I go about doing it? So I think there is this huge pool of, I would say, light tech, you need to know the tech, but you need, don't need not know the full tech. You need to know what questions to ask, how to use it. So these are the front end user group. And then there will be a group that I call them the maintenance guy or the technical guy that are not doing the groundbreaking uh, uh, technological innovations. The, the expert basket, which is very small size, are those maybe in R&D lab, in a university or maybe in some of the, some of the, um, the, the innovation team in, in the big tech firm, they will need to have very deep tech skills. So I think we, we will see that they are actually in the workforce maybe divided into three, three, three baskets. So the level of expertise will actually vary. So it is not everybody need to be the same level of tech, tech skills. But the, the, I think the issue is always when you need it, when you need it, the people are not there. When you need it, the skills are not ready. I think this is about how how far we can advise the workforce to pre-skill in certain area. There is, it's, it, it is okay, everybody start learning the basic of data analytics, it's not gonna go wrong. I think these are some of the advice we can say. I was just gonna add to that, because it, it struck me today, we, we did a really good um, round table at um, uh, PwC on cybersecurity. And, and the thing that I think sometimes we forget, so across tech, we bemoan the lack of skills, um, but we also forget that that's a commercial opportunity. So increasingly in the UK, you are seeing new skills companies been started and up um, because the education system, for whatever reason, isn't necessarily providing what you need. So uh, apprenticeships, um, you have a similar model here in Singapore, that is now being spun out into a commercial entity. And I think that, you know, uh, if I was going to set up a company, this is probably the space I'd go into, because if, if you could crack the problem of how you retrain the more mature workforce, then suddenly you have access to loads of people um, who potentially will become available in the next few years. And the reason why I thought about that in the cybersecurity context is um, that's already something we're starting to do in that even if you have a base level of technical capability, targeting those people to then specialize in cybersecurity is much faster than trying to grow someone from scratch. But I suppose my, my point is that um, we bemoan the lack of skills, 
but actually that's a commercial opportunity. And my expectation is that we will see more and more companies coming through the pipeline who are trying to tackle that. And maybe to way give you an opportunity to talk and get your thoughts, particularly as someone who's very well grounded in coding, AI, et cetera, for a long time. So it'd be interesting to get your perspective on that discussion. <coughs> I don't think it's that easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, technology is becoming increasingly complicated. Um, retraining the workforce is increasingly complicated as population ages. Um, so I think a nice concept uh, is a catch-up game that we need to play. I mean, you have to uh, lower the complexity of the tasks that you do at the programming level to a position where, you know, that, uh, car driver or truck driver is able to, to get there and contribute meaningful value. Um, I don't say uh, it's not possible. I, I, I think it's, it's not easy. <laughs> I love this. Let's have a debate. Um, no, uh, no. I, so I think my, my I think my point is it's a commercial opportunity, right? Because it is so difficult. But if you were the company that could crack that, you'd be solving a massive problem that no one else has managed to do yet. Yeah, Nat Natalie, I just want to add on that uh, I, I'm here to uh, call for collaborations to challenge this problem because we are serious about um, overcoming the biasness of startup company, tech firm, who think that any anybody above 30 is not ain't gonna make it. I, I, we, I strongly believe that we need to overcome this because the whole world is facing an aging populations and we need to ask ourselves, what can we, how can we leverage on the experience of these people who have domain expertise in particular industries? How can we help them to live well and work well in the new world? So, so we are looking for, seriously, we are looking for partners later on. Anybody want to crack the code, come and talk to me. And we are working with university, uh, with a multidisciplinary team, in, including neuroscientists, including psychologists, including um, uh, uh, pedagogists who are coming in together and say that how can we reduce cognitive load of uh, middle age like myself, 40 and above, who know how to learn and work well in the kind of high high intensity environment like a tech startup and all that yeah but, but so, so that I is that is less of a problem i mean uh, you've studied your phd you've studied a degree you can relatively easy learn more skills the problem is not you it's not me it's not us uh, the problem is the the truck driver who has been displaced out of the the his job because now the trucks are automatic has no education or very little education and we are trying to say look why don't we put him to do some high-tech programming skill at the cybersecurity. I don't know how that works. <laughs> uh, um, as, as, it happens, uh, as it happens in the US, uh, the, the salary for truck drivers, I think, has been going up 15% year on year um, because everyone's sort of expecting automation that hasn't come. Um, I think that you know, there are kind of two sides to this, right? Um, and on one side, and a potentially scary side, is what happens when the day comes where technology gets so good that you know, it genuinely becomes better than certain humans at doing the tasks that those humans can do. Right? What do we do about that? And I think that you know, trying to upskill people is great, and we should be doing that whenever we can. But businesses don't think that way. No business is going to think, I'm going to solve my customer's problem and constrain myself to using this kind of resource to do it. Businesses are going to think about, how do I solve my customer's problem in the best way I can, in the cheapest way I possibly can? And if that solution is, is a machine, then that's kind of the way they're going to go, right? Um, and that does leave a big question about what do we do with, you know, I mean, I think it's probably less of a concern to somewhere like Singapore, uh, which has always kind of bred quite a, um, quite a well-educated workforce, but somewhere larger, right? There isn't a city state uh, like the US that has such huge um, inequality across you know, both coasts and, and sort of the middle ground, and also across Europe, you know, where historically there has been a big manufacturing base, and, and workers in factories have made up the middle class, that's no longer going to exist, right? That's where the problem's going to come. Um, and I think there's a big role for, for government in that as well. So it's not just a case of, you know, commercially, yes, there's loads of things that you can be doing, um, but you won't be able to solve the problem uh, unless, you know, you have sort of market-changing legislation and regulation coming into the space. Yeah, I, I, I choose not to, firstly, I choose not to believe that the day that the human beings just sit around and the machines working around us, I, or the robots sit around, <laughs> I, I think the day will not, at least not in my time, <laughs> I won't see it. 
Um, secondly, I, I choose to believe that technology, today's technology is very different from the past 200 years. Because today's technology, precisely like what you say, is that a lot of time technology is so easy to use that individual can plug and play. So I, I do believe that technology has democratized every one of us to be able to be the <coughs> maker. That means whether we are just chasing for the next job or we can create the next job for ourselves. So I, I choose to believe that the, the option is open today. And moreover, is um, as, com as we say that companies are looking at where can they access talent and skills uh, where they can complete the task may, may or may not be full time. So the options again, uh, if, we, if we look across, um, I, I love to cite this case about what my son told me about uh, on, on Spotify, my son is here with me, <laughs> uh, uh, um, about Spotify, there is this young man called Alan Walker and able to create his music on a keyboard and ma ma uh, have 800 million, dollars, 800, down 800 million downloads. So, so today, if we know how to use the leverage of the right kind of technology platform, we can create a living for ourselves. Unlike before, we are always queuing up for the next job. So, so I think it's not so gloomy. It is very, it's full of opportunity from my perspective. So I, I agree with that. Um, the trouble is you're, you're always subject to supply and demand dynamics. And for every Alan Walker that's out there who's managed to do very well, um, you know, there'll be lots of other musicians and artists and sort of playwrights and sculptors who, who are doing something that they enjoy and really add value to the world. But in, in these ecosystems, you know, consumers don't want to have that sort of level of choice necessarily, right? The vast majority are very happy following uh, Ed Sheeran, I, I don't know if that's old these days, um, and, and Taylor Swift, is she still relevant? I don't know. Um, <laughs> it, you know, like va the vast majority of people don't, um, don't have the demand for, for that breadth and that depth, I guess, of, um, of things. And I think the same thing applies when it comes to work. I think the internet and technology enables lots of business models that are uniquely uh, uh, viable because of the technology we have. But, you, you know, there's a certain level of limit to that. And the danger comes where you have people who were brought up in a very different economy, who were brought up um, on skills that, uh, you know, don't really apply to lots of parts of society today. Um, you know, we can help them as much as we can, but sometimes, you know, fundamentally it'll be very hard. I, I, you can see that I'm trying to be an optimist <laughs> to the audience. Um, I, I choose, uh, this morning I think um, a lot of, some of my co uh, Norwegian friend was with me at NUS and then we bumped into a, a, Singapore, a local Singapore chap, Vera, and he started his uh, social enterprise. Um, that he, he has a mission to want to create a sustainable living lab that help people recycle, repair stuff, and, and not to just throw them away. And, and he, he has come across, he has created his own very interesting, impactful pedagogical training to train simple people, laymen who know how to repair fans, repair stuff. No, what I'm trying to say is that a, a man like him, highly educated, but there are a lot of opportunity that he doesn't have to wait for the next full-time job because if you if you are very clear about a mission in life, regardless of how difficult it is, you're gonna do do and try and do and try again. I think that's the kind of spirit we need from everybody. Where the, the employer will, will value, I'm sure, not somebody who say, "Oh, I, I need a job. Can you give me a job?" That's that's, that's what everybody wants, but um, not everybody. I'm, I'm I'm not trying to. <laughs> Same, same my point of view. Yeah. Look, I come from Spain. Um, <laughs> <laughs> why is that funny? <laughs> you know, Spain was hit very strongly by the economic crisis. Yeah. You know what the government did as opposed to, you know, educating the people? Say, Go be entrepreneurs. Why? Because if you're an entrepreneur, you don't count in the unemployment list, and suddenly the unemployment goes down. And I was saying, Jesus Christ, I mean, how can they be so reckless with respect to the people. I mean, being an entrepreneur, it's bloody hard. Bloody hard. And you just throw your population and say, be an entrepreneur. My point is, I agree with you. And if you have that, if you are able to nurture that talent, and I know Singapore is, is you know, in education-wise, is up there, it is fantastic. But not everybody is, is uh, people, some people just want, feel comfortable working for someone else. 
And the problem in my eyes is that if you compare to the previous industrial revolution, I think we discussed this in, in, our, in our call, right? I just want to share it with the audience. So you build, uh, you build a pyramid, right? And uh, on top of the pyramid is the creative, uh, entrepreneurial, researchers, all these type of jobs that software is going to have a very hard time in automating. And then you put the white collar workers, the blue collar workers, so you, are, you are decreasing in the pyramid, right? And on the bottom layer, the completely unskilled workers. So what happened in the previous industrial revolution, we applied a SOC at the bottom layer of the pyramid, right? And yes, the net effect was positive because many people got retrained and from working on the fields, they went to be cashiers at the supermarket. So the net effect was positive, the economy was prosperous, and the life quality of everybody one way or the other improved. I think the problem we are facing now with technology is rather different because we are not applying just a shock at the bottom layer of the pyramid. We are applying to the blue and the white collar workers. Mm -hmm. We're applying it at the same time at many different layers um, with in different verticals and, and countries are going to react differently. And then the factor that is there is the human and the capability of the human to learn and adapt. And notably, we have not been, we don't learn very fast, not compared to the evolution of technology and how technology is disrupting our ecosystem, our, our life. And I, 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 I like what you say, I mean, let's retrain the people to valuable things. That is the only way, uh, I think, but, but we cannot be naive and say, look, uh, it's going to be like the previous one. No, no, I think this one is, is we are in for a ride. And, and governments, and we were discussing that before, have the obligation to prevent and, and, and see how that is going to affect. I don't think many people really realize it. We're talking about Facebook and, and in the US and how, uh, and I don't say it like, like that in every place in the world, how the politicians hardly understand what the internet or, or, or the web really is. How are they going to legislate in you know one of these things? How are they going to protect the society against this disruption that is not going to stop? Um, I think that is the main problem. Um, just to come in on that, I, I actually think this is key, right, in terms of, and to a degree we've been here before, I at least in the UK, when um, you look at the uh, manufacturing sector in the 80s and how um, jobs disappeared very, very quickly and government, the government wasn't prepared and you suddenly had lots of unemployed, not very happy people and it, it was a um, sort of rushed response rather than a premeditated preparation and I think one of the biggest challenges for government um, and actually in every country I, I can't really think of a country that won't be affected is trying to understand where the impact is going to be in society both in terms of geography um, but also sectors so in uh, in the UK we worry uh, particularly about coastal towns for example coastal towns have uh, relatively high unemployment we really struggle um, to attract uh, companies there, the education uh, system sense, tends to be more poor, but you can't regulate to deal with that. You can't pass laws to deal with that. Um, and, and back to your point, um, lawmakers, and I say this as a civil servant, aren't always best placed to judge what is the right action to take. And so my view is going forward, we have to find some way that we have a more constructive conversation between uh, the tech community who is going to understand how the world is going to change, um, but also government officials about what that's going to look like in reality. And th the biggest challenge is, is to get out of the bubble. So back to your very good point, the vast majority of us in this room, we're not gonna be affected by this, we are the lucky ones. So how on earth do you understand those outside the bubble um, who are not necessarily going to see all the benefits of technology, and we are seeing that play out in global politics now. Ian, I know you've been trying to say something for a little bit. <laughs> any, any thoughts from your perspective? Yeah, I just, you know, I'm an eternal optimist, and I, I like to simplify things. So I know it may look like it, but I wasn't around with the when the spinning jennies were wheeled out, um, when the cotton mills were taken over and putting artisans out of jobs. Uh, I wasn't there when Henry IV introduced ma ma mass production and drove people out of the factories. But I think what history shows us is technological progress and change doesn't bring about economic hardship. It doesn't put everyone out of work. If that's the case, then nobody would be, would be working today. What technological process does, progress does is not create long-term unemployment problems. Recessions, economic downturn, they create ec unemployment and unemployment problems. I think that technology pro technolo technolo technological progress 
creates value, it improves productivity, and that, that extra work can be deployed elsewhere and has been deployed elsewhere. Uh, it creates new requirements for new types of roles, new types of skills. We talked an awful lot about the impact of AI on, let's say, the user end of the chain, but the growth in AI actually creates requirements for new skills and new jobs in creating the AI in the first place and creating the platforms in the first place. So it's kind of yin and, yin and, yin and yang. And there was a study released recently by the International Labour Organization that is kind of open and honest, and it says, yes, there will be hardship in some sectors, um, mundane, routine, repetitive jobs in administration, in finance, um, and in factories will probably uh, experience some, some reduction in, in, in jobs. But there's going to be a net gain. When we look at the growth and the opportunities that AI will create in, say, the creative industries, it will open that sector to, to people who wouldn't ordinarily be able to participate. Um, it's going to re increase requirement for analysts, data analysts, uh, for, for coders, for software architecture. Uh, we find in AI that one thing that AI has certainly done is swung the pendulum in, in computing away from computer science and hardcore coding to mathematics. Um, the core algorithms is all about pure mathematics. So suddenly you've got a whole marketplace opening up for really strong mathematicians. Yes, you still need your hardcore coders, because as good as those mathematicians are, they're not very good programmers, but they'll come up with the, the, the pure raw concept, hand it over to a hardcore coder, and they'll translate it into something that can be implemented and commercialized. So in terms of our machine learning experts, most of them have got PhDs in bioinformatics, they've got astro we've got astrophysicists, we haven't got hardcore computer science and coders doing the machine learning. They're the ones actually building the platform and making it robust and making it implementable. So this, I think, AI actually creates new types of roles and new skill requirements. So I'm, I'm very upbeat and op optimistic about it. So Ian, I would sort of medium run to long run, like fully back that. I think that you know, the combination of technology and market forces has been perhaps the premier force for lifting people out of poverty over the last few hundred years. It's been the premier force for moving people into the middle class and driving us forward as a species. Um, the trouble comes uh, at sort of the, the inflection points, right? Um, so even in the absence of, uh, of AI, you know, we can sort of look at what happened in Detroit and in Wisconsin and Illinois in 2008, 2009, and sort of follow the lives of some of the individuals there. And I think it'd be pretty hard to claim that there was no economic hardship there, right? Um, in the medium run, you know, yes, you will create new jobs. The, the, the trouble comes when it's not the same individuals who get those new jobs, right? You're opening up a marketplace for mathematicians, you know, advanced mathematicians. <coughs> They're not going to be the same people um, coming off of the GM assembly plant. Um, and, you know, I think if we step into that world without <coughs> being prepared to deal with some of those consequences, uh, you know, people's lives are going to be pretty tough. Um, and, you know, you're going to get sort of social consequences of it as well. So I think, you know, I, don't, I wouldn't want anyone to walk away thinking that technology is bad and we ought to walk away from technology in the long run. Um, but I think we must be realistic about some of the issues we have to deal with on our journey. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so, so, so I, I just come back on that and just say, okay, we, but we need to carefully look at what caused that to happen in Detroit. Was it technology progression, or was it somebody else in the world, uh, elsewhere in the world, being able to produce cars cheaper because they had a because because they had a lower cost base? Mm -hmm. So, is it technology progression, or is it no, that's, that's cost, a cost it's not advantage? Even technology yeah. progression yet. But imagine a world where it, is, it does become technolo techno technology progression, right? Where it's not someone else can do it cheaper and they'll get paid for it, but an algorithm can do it cheaper, right? So then that value then accrues to the corporation that owns the IP to that algorithm rather than any human individuals. I think, you know, my point is we're not even there yet and it's already quite bad. Let's see what happens when we get there. <laughs> Look, you, you mentioned that it's just the um, simple repetitive tasks that are automated. No. Um, my company does it. We are, we are helping banks um, automate knowledge workers out of cognitive complex tasks like reading powers of attorney and, and balance sheets and all that stuff. This is not, you know, the RPA kind of thing, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. This is a cognitive complex process that requires a skill, training, experience, and education. I mean, to read a power of attorney, you need some certain level of legal training and some experience and all that. And, and the language is very varied, so it's not just a statistics or, or mathematics, it's more the NLP, the reasoning, and the, and the knowledge representation that are involved there, because are symbols, and language is very varied, so you cannot really apply 
the uh, pattern recognition, statistical approach of, of machine learning. We are already there. We are, we are doing those things. I mean, my company is still small, we're going very fast. But that's the, that's the kind of things we are, we are doing. And my point was when you start combining those things across the, uh, the, the pyramid and across the verticals, I mean, the issue is, again, in my eyes, the speed of humans to learn. I don't have any data, and I don't say uh, technology is bad. Oh, sorry, uh, <laughs> I don't say technology is bad or uh, we should stop it, much the contrary. I mean, this is my life, this is my living, right? So no, um, I, I just see uh, some empty space that actually no one knows how it's going to be uh, filled and what's going to happen. And to me, it creates a question mark, that, that's it. Mate, I'm just gonna jump in because we're, we're, we're approaching 15 more minutes to go, so I just want to keep you track of time. We've got a number of questions from the audience, so please do provide in some more questions. I'm just going to summarise some of them, so if I don't touch on your question directly, I apologise, you can harass me later. Um, we, we've talked a lot about sort of the high-end skill sets. What are some of the low-end skill sets that are going to be relevant? What are the, what are the basic, more basic skill sets that remain relevant uh, as we move forward? So I think um, th there'll be loads, right? And like, I'm certainly not a pessimist when it comes to technology. I think there'll be lots of things that are worth humans doing, that uh, you know, millions, billions of things that we haven't even discovered yet. Um, and, and actually, part of the, the, the upside of automating some of the stuff is that we free up people to do better things. Um, and there's a whole universe of those things around just interacting with other people. You know, like humans will always have an advantage over machines uh, when it comes to you know, doing anything that involves interacting with someone else, whether that's uh, you know, taking care of the sick or doing marketing and sales and all that sort of stuff. Um, and you don't need a, a PhD in computer science to do it because I'd be screwed if you did. <laughs> um, firstly, I, I disagree there is such terminology called low-end skill set. There is no high-end skills nor low-end skills. There is only such thing as called in-demand skills. That means what the market actually want, you, want, want us to do. Um, so I, I think please, please do not believe that the coder are high skills and you are low skills. It's not true. Uh, just that in whichever industry you're in, whether that is the kind of skill set that your employer uh, demand you to do. Um, I would say that let's forget for, for a moment in time, we just, for, for a moment we just forget about the tech skills, about the coding, the data analytics, the AI and all that stuff, although the title about talk about AI. Is that I think moving forward in, in a society where change are rapid, where a lot of people will be anxious uh, and we need to continue to interact with, um, with technology and we, we are constantly challenged to may, may require to change jobs. Um, I would say that first of all is the self-management is key because if you can't manage the self to be well enough, then you're gonna go through a lot of tremendous stress, mental, mental stress. So I think I would put that as a first emphasis. Secondly, I would think that how do, how do we empathize with each other that working in this kind of environment, living and working in this kind of environment is secondly important. How can we help the others to come along? To come along and say that it's okay, we will move along together. So I thought that is the second important thing. The, the, the part about coding, the part about learning AI, I call it application skill, it's the easiest to learn from my perspective. Whether you're looking in the, in the lab, you're working with what, whatever machines, equipment you, you need to work with, the company and yourself will know how to navigate and able to acquire the skill set. I think it's a, it's a kind of non-tech skills. I would think that that should be something we, we really think carefully, how can the social skills, the kind of cognitive skill set, to be mental agility, how do we know how to uh, learn from one do domain discipline to go into the next domain or discipline, although we're not trained before, and, and about self. I, I think that is something that is important for us to know how to live, live well first before we talk about work well. Yeah. Um, I was just gonna flag one sector that's um, really having a re renaissance in the UK, and that's really the creative arts. Um, and that's for two reasons. One, that's in terms of developing content for the tech world, so whether that's virtual reality or augmented reality, that's a, a great area um, to get into. Um, but also just in terms of the demands of the market. So I think a lot about how do we export 
and actually sort of creative goods which are personalized, individual, those are the things that people want to buy. They don't want to buy the mass produced. And so actually the creative sector, which maybe we've forgotten about a little bit over the, the last few years, is absolutely going through the roof on our stats. I think the another one is the care sectors that will require a lot of human, human touch and human interaction. Maybe a relevant example also that's sort of seen direct application of AI through uh, the use of insurance, so chatbots in particular. What we're finding then is chatbots having more interactions per day than insurers ever had before. And the resultant actually, because it's not all AI interaction, actually you need more people on the call centre, the more activity, the more interaction. Uh, the one example is actually a UK example where suddenly the insurer is discovering potential suicide. And so now you're actually preventing suicide happening, something the insurer never knew about before that's creating jobs and creating greater interactions and more value. I think the other point uh, to be made here is, as I listen to everyone talking is, and I'm thinking about the car analogies we're talking about, actually, I don't know how a car operates. I don't need to know. So when you think about AI, not everyone needs to know the detail of the AI. A car is a black box to me, but it does make my life more efficient. The better the car, the less I have to pay for, the more efficient my life gets, et cetera, et cetera. So as, as we look to things, Technology makes our lives more efficient, which may reduce the hours in the day we need to go and work, but that in itself creates productivity because we can think better and clearer. Wh one of the other questions coming through is really around bias in AI. Uh, and perhaps Ian and, and Sine, give your comments on, on how, how we prevent bias in AI. Uh, <coughs> so one of the driving factors b behind myself and my colleague Chris Ganji, who's here, He's a co-founder and CEO at Amplify. Was we both worked for BP, the oil major, and we used to do long-term outlooks to try and spot future disruptions. Those outlooks were fundamentally underwhelming because they were purely influenced by BP's biases and prejudices. So we would do develop views for 2050, and the answer was exactly what BP wanted to hear. So the whole company is just driven by its prejudices and beliefs. One of the driving factors behind creating data voyant was to try and take as much of the bias out of the analysis that we could get, because if we're worried about future disruptions, we need to spot those unknown unknowns as, and those weak signals as early as possible. But if, if I'm in denial, and BP was in denial about a number of things that transformed its industry, it paid a high cost to react to those. So our machine uses unsupervised uh, deep learning. Its analysis is completely undirected, so the results that it produces are unbiased, uh, they're very broad, they get you into areas, they make connections that you otherwise wouldn't make as a, as a researcher. So we've engineered out as much of the bias as possible as we can. The two elements I cannot engineer out is the user's query that we take to the internet, that influences analysis, and I cannot do anything about how the user then interprets and uses the results. So we can take some as much bias as we can, but there's always that human element that we can't. I'd argue there's a third part that is hard to take out, which is just the underlying bias of us as humans. <laughs> um, you know, your data set will be biased because humans have biases, and the answer to how to get it out of AI is to get it out of humans. Well, so, so I absolutely agree with that point, but it. it it's the tension with the black box point, right? And uh, actually, this is the most concerning bit about AI, in that it's going to influence so many different parts of our lives, whether that's picking what insurance you have, what medical advice you get, uh, whether the traffic lights turn on at a particular point. But because we don't understand how it works, you don't necessarily understand how the bias is going to affect you in life. And so suddenly you've got, particularly because of the nature of machine learning, you, if you've intrinsically set out a bias, it is now going, then going to expand at a, a rate of knots that you can't necessarily control or influence. So it comes back to, well, how do you deal with the data that you're given? And actually, in schools and through our education system, this is where we need to spend a lot more time thinking about how you um, interpret data. And you know, there is not necessarily a one or a zero, it's actually the story that goes on around it. And we probably don't spend enough time on that because from an efficiency point of view, we say, oh great, okay, now AI is gonna solve this problem and this problem for me without necessarily realizing what the bigger picture is.
So I think the regulator has a role to play there. Um, you know, one thing that's done reasonably well, I think, in the UK uh, is when the FCA kind of looks at new technologies, uh, you know, the whole idea around treating customers fairly, yeah. right? Um, which means that you can't actually have a neural network uh, sort of deep learning to do some of the stuff. You do need a decision tree type AI in order to be auditable, um, both from a financial perspective and from a um, bias perspective. So I completely agree with that, but it only works if the regulator understands what it's trying to do. So please go and work for the regulators. That, I promise you, is where one of the most interesting careers is going to be. So you, you had a comment? I'm, I'm not in data. I'm not in machine learning. Uh, our AI, again, is coming from a different angle. And I'm going to say something that might sound naive, and please, if no one, someone has the, um, the, the information, I'm very happy to be educated. So I've been listening to uh, all these things about explainability of AI and, and all this stuff. And I, I tend to go back to my training in computer science, right? I said, software is deterministic. Software is deterministic. So that means that you have inputs, you have a black box, and you have outputs. But there is a set of rules within the system that define the outcome. And I hear all these things about explainable AI and not explainable AI, to me that's bias. I say mm -hmm. that's a human bias. Mm -hmm. I mean, a software system is something that performs under a particular framework and set of circumstances. And you can always explain what's happening in there. It's not magic. It's not like I take a rabbit out of the hat and uh, I make up the rabbit. So again, I'm not in machine learning, I'm not in data. This is uh, you know, my, my reflection, but I, I don't see the point. And again, if someone has more information, I'd love to be educated, but I don't get it. I really don't get what is the point of this conversation about explainable AI. Okay, <laughs> so I'm gonna wrap now with one last question for everyone. So what I wanna ask you, all, I'll give you a moment to think about it, is what's your, and for you it's perhaps more pertinent in the room, and your son can stand up, but, <laughs> but what's your advice to your future grandchildren or children today around skills they should learn, ideally in 30 seconds or less? And while you think about that, I'll, I'll just reflect on your comment in Let terms of... <laughs> um, I don't have time to think, but I think, but I think in terms of explainability, we don't have to explain everything. What we need to have is common sense. And so my background is a little bit more math oriented. We come up with a hypothesis first. And that's where you start from. So not everything has to be explained in depth. We need to understand what the parameters should or shouldn't be in terms of outcome. It's laziness when we don't think. Mm. So children, <laughs> in your advice. Uh, that's a tough one because I'm not leaving a legacy. I had no children. Um, <laughs> I'm God children. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy still practicing. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Uh, future generations, just enjoy life and have as much fun as you possibly can. <laughs> well, definitely. Uh, I think soft skills. Uh, I like to see this. Uh, I, I, I watch a lot of science fiction movies, and I think eventually we are going to get to a point where like, things like Matrix, where you, know, you get a uh, connection, and you're going to be able to download hard skills. I think soft skills is, is a bit more complicated to get, like communication, negotiation, all those things. Uh, hard skills, I think they are going to increasingly be uh, downgraded programming, mathematics, uh, whatnot. Yeah, I love the idea that you could download hard skills and not have to spend years doing a PhD. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Um, look, I would uh, definitely agree with that and um, add uh, critical thinking. The way I think about it is, do you remember when Oh, this is a long time ago, but sort of Microsoft first started and you'd tap, tap away on your Word document and if there wasn't a red squiggle underneath it, then everything in that document must have been spelt correctly. Um, and of course, it just depended what dictionary you were using on the Microsoft Word. And that more broadly um, applied to how we are going to be using AI, I think is applicable in terms of, uh, you, you can't always trust what is put in front of you because it depends how someone's designed it and someone's thought about it. So having a bit of um, critical thinking, but at the same time being optimistic about the opportunities has to be the right balance. Uh, relatively similar sentiments for me, I guess. Um, one point would be to get the fundamentals right. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, the world works in a certain way, right? Physics and incentives are, uh, among humans, uh, it works in a certain way. It means that, you know, as a society, you know, at the very least um, in a capitalist one, we're always looking for, you know, what I sort of think of as the smoothest downhill path towards anything, right? Whether it's 
getting from A to B, or whether it's uh, getting nutrients in your body, or, or, or whatever it might be. Right? And if you can understand the fundamentals of how the world works from a physical perspective and from an economic perspective, you can always sort of rewire yourself um, to, to benefit and, and sort of help the world, whatever form it may be in. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of danger in people who grow up uh, and they're told they're very clever because they can, they have long words and, uh, you know, they know lots of acronyms um, and they have lots of photos on their wall with diplomas. Um, but the minute the world changes such that the assumptions that you've made at a relatively medium level um, no longer apply, it's really hard, right? So that's one, you know, be, being able to you know, try to understand the fundamental levels of, of why things are the way they are. Um, and secondly, learning to learn is, is so important. Uh, and I th this is where I think most education systems, uh, at least sort of state-run education systems the world over get it wrong, um, which is, you know, today, given the resources we have, most, most people can basically learn whatever they want up to a high school level by themselves on the internet. You don't need a system to help you get there. Uh, we have the resources for it, but we don't have the skills for it necessarily. Um, and again, sort of in the spirit of needing to adapt to change that will be ever more rapid, um, being able to uh, being able to pick up new skills, pick up new knowledge, integrate new knowledge and new assumptions into your existing beliefs, and changing what you're doing based on that is going to be so important. Um, and you know, anyone that's in education, uh, I think that you guys have the most important role over the next hundred years, and I would really urge you to think about that side of things. Okay. Um. I would say there's quite simple four things. Uh, I, was, I, I wouldn't call it skills. I would say it is capacity, capacity of people. Um, one is learning to learn is very important because we need to constantly update our, our knowledge um, and, and, and things happening around us. Secondly is learning to do because we're expected to perform certain activity tasks, whether it's paid job, unpaid job. Thirdly is learning to be is about ourselves. Is about having our own identity in an ever-changing world, and this identity can be multiple identity in multiple community. Uh, we can be daytime a coder, but weekend I'm an urban sketcher. I can be looking after the stray dogs. So I think that's the kind of multiple identity that we need to we need to create because today in the world that jobs are changing, it is we cannot just extend our hand and say hi. So and so I'm here. I'm, my job is this. I'm working in this company. I think we need to expand our learning to be. Uh, and, and, and keep refining what learning the, the B myself all about. The fourth is learning to live together. I think that is very, very key because we are all human fundamentally and how can we, learning to be is about, uh, to live together is about also looking after the, our ecosystem, the environment, so be responsible. So I think just remember, remember these four pillars of lifelong learning, you won't go wrong. Well, thank you very much to the panelists. A uh, warm round of applause, please. Um, thank you very much for seeing Thank you. Uh, some will be around afterwards for conversation. Unfortunately, Natalie, I know you've got to run. Yeah, so sure. thank you very much for your time and pushing a little bit. So yeah, thank you. I have an old Sorry, I was just, I was going to, I'm going to Kuala Lumpur to take uh, nine British artificial intelligence companies. Uh, we hope to bring them back in Singapore in due course. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> See you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.